Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Good morning. It's good to open the word with you this morning. Um, As some of you, many of you maybe know, uh, any given morning, early in the morning, you will find me out uh, jogging. I love jogging. Uh, I live two miles from the church, basically right off of Emerson, our street here. And so I love to basically just jog from here to church uh, and back. I can't compete with uh, Paxson's love of running, but nonetheless, I'm pretty pretty happy with that. I like running. Um, I was running about two months ago, and on my way back towards the house, um, I passed what I thought from a distance was maybe a, maybe a homeless fellow, um, got a little closer, realized that uh, this homeless fellow was pushing a, a shopping cart uh, of some type, got a little closer, realized that there was something in the cart, um, got a little closer, realized that um, it was a teenager, teenage boy, probably 14, 15 years old. Um, and as I got right up to him, I realized it wasn't a him, it was a, a them, that there was a five, six-year-old little girl, same age as my oldest son, um, sitting in the cart that he was pushing um, down the street. So as I came up to them, thinking thoughts, um, I jogged right past them. I didn't stop. I kept going. And as the Holy Spirit will tend to do, um, began to speak to me, as I'm finishing the jog now and getting closer to my own home, the story of the Good Samaritan comes to mind. Only I'm not the Good Samaritan in the story. I'm the priest who literally physically in that moment went out of my way to go around a person, two people, I don't know their situation, clearly there was some sort of a need, and I kept going. So I get home, and by this point, the Lord has made it abundantly clear what needs to happen, and I I quickly, I say, Alana, I've made the dumbest mistake in my life. Give me a second. got to hop in the car and go find these two kids. I hop back in the car. I drive up and down Emerson. I drive up and down every single side street, anywhere near where they were. I cannot find them. I don't know where they went. I go home. Again, um, just overwhelmed with, with what has just taken place, and Alana and I are talking about it. Um, a few hours later, I'm home with the kids and Alana is driving up and down the same street, Emerson. Um, she does not see them, but she's in, she sees another young lady who is late teenager, maybe 20. Um, she's at the bus stop. She's wearing a McDonald's uniform and she's got three little kids, again, my kids' age, little tiny kids, uh, in her hand as she's waiting for the bus stop. And, and I don't doubt that the Spirit was continuing to move in, in our lives because Alana did what I didn't do and she stopped. She pulled over. She said, do you guys need a ride anywhere? And uh, she said, yeah, actually we do. Um, We're in the process of moving. And so Alana took her and the three kids. We have Buku car seats in our car, and she was able to take them um, to the home that she was moving out of. And over the course of that drive, a conversation began to develop, and Alana began to hear about this gal's needs and her situation, and that she was moving into a a government-provided apartment, and she literally had nothing to put into that uh, apartment. And so many of you saw a a Facebook note that popped up later that day when Alana said, I've made a new friend and she's moved and she needs help with just basic needs of the home, furniture, supplies, everything. If you have something laying around, could you help us out? Well over 20 families from our church, other churches, um, pulled together the things that they had that you had in your own home. And uh, the next week we were able to 
literally pull up with a U-Haul truck filled with four rooms full of furniture and cleaning supplies and toys for her kids. Um, And five of our families from church were able to go and deliver and unload and set up and spend time with her, pray with her, invite her to know Christ and to be a part of this church. I cannot tie a bow on this story for you in the sense that there was an opportunity to reach out to someone that I I missed. And yet at the same time, even as I am repenting of that, I am so thankful for what God did in providing yet another opportunity with another family who we didn't know their entire story, we didn't know their situation, but God was moving and Alana responded to an opportunity. You know, we're in the the fourth week now of a five-week series as we consider what does it mean for our church to do what we are called to do. And so you have heard about worship, grow, serve, and today we're going to talk more about reach, what it looks like for us as a church to, to reach. And I hope that in that there is a moment of repentance and yet there's also a moment of excitement and celebration and wanting to be used by God to do just that, to, to reach At the same time, we've been offering you these five what we call question marks that are just ways to ask ourselves how are we living out um, and experiencing the gospel in our own lives. And the, the question mark that applies here is simply this, who in my life, who in my life needs to hear and receive the gospel? So as we look at this passage from Acts chapter 11 this morning and reflect on our own experiences, um, I want to give you this bottom line, this reality from this passage this morning, and this is, this is it. Jesus, as you know, is such good news that our lives become focused on him and on reaching others with his good news. So as we come to Acts chapter 11 this morning, I want to offer you five gospel applications as we think about this, and you will find those in the handout inside your bulletin this morning. They are these. We reach broken people like ourselves with the gospel through persecution and hardship by radically speaking the gospel, by the power of God's hand, by multiplying disciples concentrically, and because we bear the name of Christ. So let's go to Acts chapter 11. Number one, we reach through persecution and hardship. This is a powerful passage. Listen again, just the first few words that indicate the situation. It says this in verse 19, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen. Persecution. What does that word mean? In its simplest form, it it is this. It is being attacked for your faith in Christ Jesus. You know, in a story that was reported by a total of zero American news networks that has been developing over the last several weeks, somewhere between 120 and 300 Christians have been brutally murdered in Nigeria for their faith. That is persecution. It is not simply something from Acts, and we thank God that we do not necessarily experience that in our lives today, here and now, but there are no promises that that is the case permanently. In fact, quite the opposite as we seek the scripture. In addition, I would tell you that the word persecution shows up a lot in the book of Acts. Sometimes it gets translated persecution. Other times it just gets translated as hardship, as tribulation. We know that as we follow Christ in this world that it will be difficult. Here it is about Stephen. Stephen was actually the very first Christian who was killed for his faith. Why was he killed? Acts chapter 7 is the scene, and it tells us very clearly, he told the lost people in Israel, Jesus, whom you crucified, who died, has been resurrected. He was and is the promised Messiah. He is the Savior of the world, and he is alive, and for that, they killed him. See, for Stephen, his life had become focused on Jesus. His life had become focused on reaching the lost with the good news, and you and I should expect pushback of one type or another from Satan, from a broken world, when we seek to share, to reach out in any way, shape, or form, in any place and in any time with the good news of the gospel. 
See, the story of Acts is the story of the church of Jesus Christ being attacked and suffering hardship. Jesus said the same thing himself in John chapter 15. He said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. But it's at the end of the story, brothers and sisters. The murder of Stephen from the day that he was murdered until the day that we sit here now in our seats, the intentions that they had, God has used it for the exact opposite effect. We praise God for that, that though they intended it for one thing, God has done another. Listen to Joseph in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 50. He says this, as for you, you meant it for evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive even as they are today. We do not fear the attacks of the enemy. We reach others in and through persecution, hardship. Are you suffering this morning? Do you know that God the Father uses even your worst moments, your worst suffering for good? Jesus says in John chapter 16, in this world, you will have trouble, but what? Take heart, for I have overcome the world, says Jesus. God uses persecution to fan from embers into flame the heart of the church to be on mission to share the good news of Jesus. Look at what happens as soon as Stephen is murdered for his faith in Acts chapter eight, it says on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. Those who had been scattered preached the word of God wherever they went. This is not necessarily at first glance the cause and effect that we would expect. But God is so good that he turns even our pain into opportunities to preach. Let me tell you about my brother and sister, Dave and Frieda Rigby. They used an opportunity. Frieda passed away on March 7th after a four year battle with cancer, as most of you are well aware. They did not say, God, why did you give me this hardship? They said, Lord, use this hardship for your glory and to expand the gospel. And maybe they didn't understand exactly why it had come, but I promise you that they got a very clear insight the day that they were able to share in the same hospital that Frida was with her brother, David, who up to that point had not received the good news of the gospel. But when he saw the way that Frida approached her cancer and her faith, They shared with him afresh, and he received in the last days of his life Jesus as his Lord and Savior. God uses persecution. He uses hardship to reach. Number two, we reach by radically speaking the gospel. Listen to the next two verses. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. Hang on to that phrase. But there were some, some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. Understand what's happening here. Believers are fleeing Jerusalem left and right. They go, among other places, to Antioch that is 500 miles away. Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. It is unique because like every other city in the Roman Empire and every other city in America, they worshiped all kinds of bad idols and did all kinds of terrible things. Same story, but this is where God wanted the gospel spoken. These believers are radical. They are talking to people who look different than themselves. They're talking to people who look different than themselves about the gospel. And this really is the radical gospel in action. Where did this start? Well, in Acts chapter 10, it takes God literally sending Peter a vision And in this vision, Peter finally comes to understand that the gospel teaches us to reach 
out to all people. At the very end of that little story, listen to Acts 10, 34 and 35. This is Peter's summary of what he learned from God. Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. See, for an Old Testament Jew, there were two types of people, patriot fans and everyone else. No. Jews and everyone else. That everyone else here, it's called Hellenists. It means Gentiles. That is all of us. Thank God that this passage is in the scripture because unless you are a Jew, this is us. And the scripture says it ought to go to all people. And so slowly but surely, these believers are getting it. But you can understand there's a very good reason that they are struggling with this because the vast majority of Gentiles for all time, to put it lightly, had completely rejected God. And so at first, they only share with Jews. But there were some. There were some. Oh God, make us the sum that went out and literally changed the world beginning in cities like Antioch. Let's talk about our cities. Palm Bay and Melbourne. If you draw a neat little circle around Palm Bay and Melbourne and just assess who are we as a couple of twin cities, we are 69% white. We are 31% African American, Hispanic, and Asian. We are a hodgepodge of boomers, busters, Gen Xers, Gen Yers, Gen Zers, those wonderful millennials, we got them all. We are 60% white collar and 40% blue collar. We are 61% two parent homes. We are 39% one parent homes. You ready for this? We are 36% Republican, 36% Democrat, 28% Independent. We have our own Jew-Gentile situation. And what the gospel says is that the gospel will go to all people. All people. You want to know God's heart? If we can, let's go to the end of the book. Let's go to the end of scripture and Revelation paints a beautiful picture of God's heart, God's plan, God's expectation, and God's promise when he says this, after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. Amen? We love the scripture and this is what the scripture invites us to be a part of, talking to people who look different than ourselves. Now let's back up just a, just a half step. For many of us, it's not that hard. Or maybe it's harder. Radically speaking, the gospel just means talking to people just talking to people. Why don't we sometimes talk to people with our words, with our actions, with our lives? Why don't we sometimes talk to people about Jesus, the best news of all time? As I thought about my, my own heart, as I thought about believers, even in our country, I think we don't talk because we're busy sometimes. We don't talk sometimes because we're really comfortable we don't talk sometimes because there's a, there's a fear of failure, a fear of rejection. I was praying about this yesterday and just asking that God would renew and refresh my heart. And I just heard him say clearly in that just that there is oftentimes in me a lack of love. Maybe there's a lack of faith that I just don't trust God to do what he has already promised to do. But that prayer quickly turned to God Start, refresh, renew the work in me. Renew the work in my church. Renew the work in our city. Renew the work in this county. God, move the gospel in this country and throughout our world afresh, but start it in me. 
You know, I think about us as, as church people. You know, you would think, and sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, but sometimes the hardest place for us to be able to, to talk to people about Jesus might literally be here in this room on a Sunday morning. And I'm encouraged even this morning, I think we do a great job at this church of doing just that. But at the same time, I am guilty of, we're probably all guilty of, at one moment or another, we see somebody new walk in the doors. Honey, who is that? Do you know them? I'm not sure if I know them. Oh, no eye contact. Don't make eye contact. Look away. Okay, you go bathrooms. I'll go nursery. We can just get out of here. You ever been there? You have that moment. You're like, I don't know who they are, but I got something I got to do. Let me just encourage you. Something that has been such a humongous blessing in my life as I've seen it modeled, as I've begun to just try and do that more often myself, whether it's here Sunday morning or it's Tuesday afternoon at work or it's in your neighborhood on a walk, whatever it might be, sometimes it's easy to just jog by somebody. Try this instead, right? Hi, my name's Ben. What's your name? Sherry. Sherry, it's nice to meet you. Can we do that? It's that easy. It's that simple. Usually the one thing that happens is we go, well, I might have met them before. Now what do I say? (laughs) Guys, I went to seminary. I crammed three years into four. Let me give you the answer. After you say, hi, my name is Ben, or insert your name here, here's what you say. Have we met before? It's okay. I'd rather be forgiven of having met somebody twice than having to ask to be forgiven for ignoring them. We have such an awesome opportunity just to to begin to build a relationship, to connect with somebody. If you say, I'm willing to do that, I'm happy to do that, I love that, I'm just not sure what comes next, let me just offer you one practical tool. You heard Pastor Randy Pope mention it about a month ago. We're going to have our Friendship Evangelism Seminar Saturday, April 6th. Sign up in the bulletin, sign up online. Just a chance to go, okay, so what comes next? I love people, I want to talk to them. I just, I need help understanding how do I share my faith? We want to give you the tools to be able to do that. Number three. We reach by the power of God's hand. Let us never miss this fact. We reach by God's hand. Verse 21, and the hand of the Lord was with them, the hand of the Lord. And as a result, a great number who believed turned to the Lord. This is great news because it's God's power. It's God's love. It's God's grace. The hand of the Lord brought a massive number of people to salvation. And we see the same thread throughout Acts and and all of scripture. In Acts 16, 14, it says, the Lord opened Lydia's heart and a great number of people came to, uh, to respond to Paul's message. Acts 13, 48, all who were appointed for eternal life believed. What do you mean? Well, let me keep it real simple. God in his goodness is sovereign. And we as people are responsible. What does that look like? How does that play itself out? I'll tell you how it plays out. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. See both very clearly. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 through 14 In him, that is in Christ, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included when Christ, when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Why? Who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. It is God's hand. He is sovereign, and yet we are also responsible. So you may say, well, then what is the point of me sharing the gospel? I would offer you a passage that our church has spent much time praying over and thinking over. 2 Corinthians 5, we are Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. Romans 10, 15, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. 
I wanna be, we wanna be those ambassadors. We wanna be those beautiful feet that bring the good news. But maybe you are here and you are listening this morning and you may say, what is the point of me believing the gospel? What's the point? Here's the point. Reminded afresh even this weekend, let me give you some awful news. Without exception, every single person in this room someday will die. Every single person on this planet without exception someday will die. Sin and death are real. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The wages of sin is death, not only simply death going away, but death eternally separated from God in a place called hell, says the scripture, but that is not the end of the story. Been driving in traffic. Traffic's been a little cr- crazier than, than normal here on Emerson with all the extra construction. Um, maybe like me, you've watched any human being ever try and make a left turn. You ever watch that? It is an appalling sight to see, especially in intersections around this city. What happens? They watch, they see the traffic coming, they know the traffic is coming, they wait until the last possible moment, and when nothing but sheer destruction is likely to take place, at that moment, they pull out, seeing the problem that lies ahead in front of the oncoming traffic. Vincent Ludwig and I were sitting out in front of Einstein Bagels last month and watched exactly this happen. Watched a lady make that left-hand turn. Seeing the reality of what was coming, she pulled out anyway, and we watched her car get torn apart. It is no different. We all see the reality of death coming, and yet for some reason we pull out and ignore it anyway. Is that the end of the story? This is not the end of the story. This is why I ask you to believe. Romans 5, 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You may say, you don't know how bad I am. You don't know how guilty I am. There are things that nobody knows about me. And I would say to you, you're right. I don't know, but I promise you that God does. He knows the worst of the worst that you have done. He is not surprised. And this passage says that knowing the worst that you had done while you were yet sinners, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. Jesus made the perfect exchange that we could never make ourselves. His perfect life and righteousness for your sin and shame. When he died on the cross, Your sin went on the cross. His righteousness comes to you. And all that you have to do to receive that free gift is believe. It is that simple. The scripture says this in Romans 10, 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Turn from your sin. Call on Jesus. Admit that your way hasn't worked, that only his way will work and it will be eternal life. Brothers and sisters, again, I say to you, Jesus is such good news that when this happens, our lives become focused on him and then reaching others with that same good news of the gospel. Number four, we reach by multiplying disciples concentrically. Look at the next four verses of this passage. It says this, the report of this came, all that's happening, to the ears of the church back in Jerusalem. And they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. Let me give you another definition, concentric. When we say multiplying disciples in a concentric way or concentrically, what do we we mean? 
Well, the word concentric, obviously it's a math term. It means different circles with the same center. Different circles, same center. What is the center? Jesus Christ, the good news of the gospel. Different circles. The Bible puts it this way, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Here at Covenant Church, as a part of the ends of the earth, we would say to you, circles, Palm Bay, Brevard County, to the ends of the earth. So what happens here? What is taking place here in this section of the passage? First, God moves the Jerusalem church to send out persecuted evangelists. What are their names, by the way? We don't know. We have no idea because the New Testament here and other places is full of you and me. Regular men and women, boys and girls who are simply faithful to the call, faithful to Jesus, and God used them. See, every single believer is a disciple maker. Every single believer has been gifted this wonderful, holy call to be able to share the same great news that we ourselves have experienced. So God first moves the Jerusalem church to send out persecuted evangelists. What happens next? A launch team or a core group is begun in the broken down city of Antioch. Jerusalem church sends out their church planter, a good church planter, maybe one of the best. His name is Barnabas. He's known throughout scripture as the son of encouragement. So they send someone that they love out. Church, do not be afraid to give away. Do not be afraid to send out. In fact, if you read the next four verses after the chapter that we are looking at now, you will see that Jerusalem church was incredibly blessed by the church that they planted when they themselves hit a moment of struggle. You'll get that in Acts 11, 27 through 30. But look at it another way. This is exactly why we at Covenant Church do faith promise missions because we want to be a part of multiplying disciples, multiplying churches that make disciples globally and locally. That's what we want to be about. And when we say reach, that is a part of what we mean. What happens next in this passage? Well, the church planter and his launch team began multiplying disciples in their city. Their new pastor began to exhort them to remain faithful with a steadfast purpose, says the scripture. And it goes on to say that a great many people were added to the Lord. That is disciples who make disciples who make disciples. That is churches who make churches who make churches. What happens next? Well, Barnabas then goes on to disciple at least one other believer to be a church planting apprentice. He goes out and gets a man named Saul and brings him to Antioch and begins to train him as to how to plant churches. And if you want to understand the power of the gospel, if you want to understand the grace of God, make sure that you realize that Saul, this guy that they've suddenly brought into the church, is the same man who is actively responsible for murdering Stephen. That is the grace of God. That is the power, the plan, and the hand of God at work. What happens next? Then Antioch Church planted more churches. Paul, formerly named Saul, is sent by Antioch Church on his first three missionary journeys out of that city with this plan, very simple. Go to every major city in the known world and plant a church share the good news of the gospel, and they do it. Why do we need to keep doing this? Why should we keep reaching? Why should we keep evangelizing? Why should we keep on church planting? Because at some point, Antioch Church stopped being an aircraft carrier a big ship that sent out the little planes to go out on mission. Jerusalem church stopped being an aircraft carrier and they became a cruise ship. They stopped being an aircraft carrier, they became a cruise liner. If you go to modern 
Antioch today, it is less than half of 1% believers. In fact, as late as the 1920s, it was still 25% believers. Fifth and finally, brothers, just in closing, understand that we reach because we bear the name of Jesus Christ. Listen to the last little verse. It's not unimportant. Verse 26, the latter half. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. It's the first time that believers are identified by the name of their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't that cool? Here's the best part. They didn't name themselves that. The people in that city who were not Christians yet looked at them and when they saw them, they saw Christ so much that they gave those people the name of Jesus. That's what we're called to. That's what we're invited to. That's what we want to be. May our words, may our actions so clearly exude the gospel, the grace of Jesus Christ that people identify us as someone who must follow Jesus. You know, the word Christian only shows up three times in the entire Bible. Only three times. But what do we call ourselves? What does the Bible, what does God himself call his people? There's a lot of names, right? They're wonderful names. He calls us things like believers, his people, his disciples, his saints. He calls us his called, his chosen, his elect, his beloved but I want to give you one more really important name that God himself names us, his people. 1 John 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. We gave our first son the name Benjamin, my name, because we loved him deeply, And that name is a way to reflect that reality. We reach out because God the Father has lavished us with his love. For no other reason. The good news. Jesus is such good news that our lives become focused on him and on reaching others with his good news. Let's pray. Lord, you are a good and a loving Father. Father, we praise you this morning for the grace that saves a man like Saul, for the grace that saves a man like me. We thank you for 10th and 20th chances and forgiveness. Lord, even when we run around the opportunities that you have given us, Father, I thank you that you are a God of grace and forgiveness. I thank you that you sent your one and only son, your favorite family member, your only family member, to die in my place, to die in our place, to save us from the certainty of death, the reality of sin, the reality of our guilt and shame, that Father, through his death and resurrection, we have been saved, we have been made alive. Father, may our lives more and more be dominated by that reality. Father, let us continue to fall more in love with you and more amazed by the fact that you would love us when we were not lovable. And Father, would it lead to us reaching? Lord, let us be a church of reach who shares the same good news that we ourselves have experienced with others around us, Father, where we live, where we work, where we play, where we learn. In every opportunity, Lord, let us always be available to say, hi, my name is Ben. Father, use us this morning, we pray. For your glory, thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.